Is Tyrion the villain of A Song of Ice and Fire? He's certainly done some dark things and is on an even darker path, so let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover A Song of Ice and Fire in full, as well as House of the Dragon and Duncan Egg, and other great fantasy worlds like The Lord of the Rings and The Witcher. Back in 1999, George R. R. Martin gave an interview about the publication of A Clash of Kings. Asked whether he had a favourite character, he replied, I've got to admit, I kind of like Tyrion Lannister. He's the villain, of course, but hey, there's nothing like a good villain. He's the villain? That may come across as a surprise to people who have only seen the TV show, where he comes out pretty well. Not perfect, few George R. R. Martin characters are, but someone we can sympathise with. But if you go back even further to George R. R. Martin's original concept for A Song of Ice and Fire, it's clear that Tyrion was meant to be the villain, or at least more villainous. He seizes the throne in a coup against his nephew, betrays his family after Jaime launches a counter-coup against him, switches sides at will, becomes love rivals with Jon Snow, and burns down Winterfell. Of course, that's not the story we're reading, and we all know that George R. R. Martin, as a gardener writer, allows the tale to shift around him as he writes it. Thinking someone is a villain quarter of a century and three books ago doesn't mean they still are today. What is intriguing, though, is that when George R. R. Martin said that, Tyrion wasn't actually that bad. All things are relative, of course, but we are made to care about Tyrion quite early on. His ill reputation precedes him. He's called the Imp, the Twisted Demon Monkey, but other than a rather cruel tongue and base habits, he seems intelligent, self-aware and loyal. A man of his word. Everyone he comes across judges him before they've even met him. His father hates him, his sister perhaps even more so. His clever and great deeds go unrecognised. When we dig a bit deeper, we learn of the chance he had at happiness with Tisha, a woman he married, and how it was so cruelly torn from him by his father. He gets more POV chapters than anyone else and comes across as funny, clever, He's the one who figures out much of what is really going on in the plot. Brave, he charges into battle several times, despite it not being his forte, and resourceful. Like George R. R. Martin, I kind of enjoy seeing the world through Tyrion's eyes. We are supposed to be sympathetic towards him, particularly in those first two books, and he definitely does have redeeming features. His pronouncement that he has a soft spot for cripples, bastards and broken things seems genuine. Note how he made that saddle for Bran, and became genuine friends with Jon. And unlike many of his peers, he does, to a degree, care about the small folk. But take a step back, and you can start to see the imperfections. He's arrogant, mocking, and manipulative. And he plays a huge role in propping up Joffrey's tyrannical regime. He can see what Joffrey is like, and he knows the truth of Cersei and Jaime's relationship. He knows that what Stannis is claiming is right, but fights against it. And it was him with the wildfire and chain idea that did the most to keep Joffrey in power. But when the battle is over, and we get to a storm of swords, it's as if the sense of injustice he has been carrying around with him really starts to boil over. He isn't rewarded for masterminding the defence of King's Landing. In fact, he is demoted from acting Hand of the King. The comfy and respected lifestyle he had got used to was taken from him. The steps he had taken to protect himself were undone, like Pycelle released from the Black Cells and Bronn promoted to better things by Tywin. The injury he had sustained in the battle made him, in his own eyes, even more ugly. He was denied Casterly Rock, made to marry against his will. Joffrey felt able to bully him with impunity. Even the things he does in this period which are objectively good, for example, refusing to sleep with Sansa until she wants it, a low bar to be sure, but enough for Sansa to start realising that he is better than the other Lannisters, are turned against him as insults. His response to all this is not positive, to say the least. He descends even deeper into drink, starts thinking darker thoughts about revenge. He takes solace in the only good thing he thinks he has, Shay and invests so much into that that when a minstrel tries to blackmail him about his relationship with Shay, his response is disproportionate and brutal. He orders him killed, and not just that, 
but cut into pieces and dropped into a pot of brown in Fleabottom. His revenge turns the people of Fleabottom into cannibals. When he is falsely accused of murdering Joffrey, it's not hard to see why. He'd been insulting and threatening Joffrey all day, getting drunker and drunker. And, if anything, from this moment on, Tyrion's sense that the world is against him just gets worse. At his trial, Osmond Kettleblack, a man he had thought was on his payroll, testifies against him, and so does Pycelle, someone Tyrion had tried to strip from power, and Shay. That one will have hurt the most. He had loved her and become obsessed with her, and she betrayed him. By then, there was really only one person left in the world that Tyrion thought was on his side, Jamie. And Jamie does release him from the Black Cells. It's perhaps ironic that Jamie's own character arc led him to decide to tell Tyrion the truth about what happened with his first wife, Tisha, and Jamie's own guilt there. He needed that honesty, but it was completely the wrong time for Tyrion to hear it. He lashes out, physically hitting Jamie and trying to hurt him with his words. Cersei is cheating on him, and he, Tyrion, killed Joffrey. The second one, at least, is a lie. So, after two books of Tyrion being a rather complicated character, but not someone you could call the main villain of the story, his entire world crashes down around him, and he does undoubtedly turn dark. Killing Shay and then Tywin is just the culmination of it all. George R. R. Martin referred to Tyrion killing Shay as probably the blackest deed that he'd ever done, the great crime of his soul. Perhaps even more disturbingly for the future direction of his character, he tells his father, as he sat there dying, that I am you, writ small, and then Jamie that I am the monster they all say I am. All this abuse he had armoured himself against for so long, he has now embraced and internalised. He spends some time at the start of A Dance with Dragons in a deep pit of despair, trying to convince himself and others that he is a terrible human, someone to be feared. The psychological journey here is clear. He has lost everything. He is hurting, he hates himself and the world, and he is lashing out. His journey in A Dance with Dragons is one of him slowly discovering himself again, or creating who he is without all the money and privilege of being a Lannister noble. He is taken along by someone else's plans, then captured, then captured again by somebody else. He loses all volition. And George R. R. Martin surrounds him with people who have lost everything and are looking for or are building a new life. John Connington, Jorah Mormont, Penny... Tyrion himself also starts to find a direction, or at least to know the direction he wants to travel in, coming to terms with what happened with his first wife Tisha, constantly asking where do whores go, finding some resolution for his lifelong obsession with dragons, and a confrontation with Cersei and Jaime. Where we are at in the story right now, Tyrion could still go either way, a complex character on a rather grey redemption arc, or into outright villainy. I suspect the key to how this goes will be when he meets Daenerys and understands that she is set on invading Westeros. On the show, he obviously fell low-key in love with her and acted as her conscience during the invasion. She wanted to firebomb cities, he cautioned against it because he cared about the small folk. In the books, though, there is definitely the potential for his darker desires to win out. He still wants revenge on his family and she has dragons. Also, he kind of persuaded young Griff, Fagon, Aegon the Sixth, whatever you want to call him, to just start his invasion without waiting for Danny. so that sets up a likely confrontation later on. There's no doubt Tyrion is, and will be, influential in the plot, and not always in a positive way, but ultimately, is he the villain of the story that George R. R. Martin claimed all those years ago? So far, no. Not in a world of other antagonists like Euron, Ramsay Bolton and even Joffrey. Tyrion has done some terrible things, but you'd be hard-pressed to present him as the worst. And that's before we even get onto the likes of the others. The bigger question is whether there even is a main villain in this story. George R. R. Martin has consistently emphasised that even his bad guy characters have reasons for what they are doing, and those reasons are often quite tragic or understandable. As he often says, everyone is the hero of their own story. 
Tyrion perhaps is rare in having the self-awareness to recognise that a lot of what he did was objectively wrong. He knew that he was a kinslayer and a monster for what he did, regardless of how justified he may have felt those actions were. As a final slant on this, we should also acknowledge that whatever he does or doesn't do in the rest of the story, Westerosi history may well present him as a bad guy anyway. He is the imp, the twisted demon monkey, the kin slayer. Even if his story culminates in an act that saves thousands of lives, say, like his brother Jamie, he may well only be remembered for the bad things. If you'd like more videos about the world of A Song of Ice and Fire, please click on the link to my playlist on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel, the best way to do that is by clicking on the link to my Patreon page on the right of your screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.